Um, so very briefly, uh, let me just review what we saw last time before we go on to some new stuff. Um, last time we were seeing uh, that in the human body, there's really only nine monosaccharides that are found uh, that are used in uh, carbohydrate uh, chemistry. And this is kind of astonishing because if you think about it, there really could be uh, an infinite number of ways of arraying carbons that are hydrated or hydrates of carbon, which is the chemical definition of carbohydrates. But there's only nine of these that are found. And um, we talked very briefly about the Anamerica effect. I don't think this is such a big deal, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, we talked uh, uh, more extensively, and this is actually important, that carbohydrates interconvert between a hemiacetal form and an aldehyde or ketone form. And that aldehyde or ketone form is reactive. That's the form that has an electrophile that can start reacting with surface proteins in your um, cells and then cause uh, eventually advanced glycosylation end products that we'll talk about today. And then um, we, talk very, we also talked about the oxonium and oxocarbenium ions. These are key ionic intermediates that are um, used, that are, that are observed when you either form or break glycosidic bonds. Um, and then we talked uh, at the very end about oligosaccharides, things like starch, that are long strings of carbohydrates that are strung together by uh, glycosidic bonds. Okay, now today I want to talk to you about complexity and uh, about oligosacchar about uh, polysaccharides that um, are a good deal more complex. So oligosaccharides are, um, we're going to define them as simply, or let's say, sorry, Polysaccharides are going to be just polymers of one or maybe two or three, you know, some small number of subunits. Okay, so like glucose strung together in a repeating uh, chain can give us cellulose, right? We talked about that. We talked about how wood um, could form cellulose, or wood is formed from cellulose, which is formed from glucose. So the polysaccharide of, um, of glucose is called cellulose. Okay, that's one form. And we also talked about glycogen, uh, the other form, uh, depending on whether it's the alpha or the beta anomer. Now, today, I want to get a little more complicated and talk about sequences of uh, saccharides, of oligosaccharides, where it's not always the same carbohydrate, the same monosaccharide strung together. And it turns out these have important consequences for the cell. We're going to see that they can um, form epitopes for antibodies to react to, that these can form um, antigens that antibodies can react with, and they have other consequences as well. So for this reason, we're going to talk about uh, oligosaccharides consisting of carbohydrate oligomers and uh, more complicated things. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I left off on this final slide right here. And I was showing you that um, end-link gly glycosylation takes place in the endoplasmic reticulin and the, um, and the Golgi complex during um, export of proteins uh, after their synthesis at the ribosome. Okay, so this is a very simplified view of the cell, but um, here in blue are the expelled proteins or the proteins that are going to appear on the surface of the cell, and these get modified um, as they're being transported by uh, the Golgi apparatus. Um, this is, uh, so this N-link glycosylation is important for um, proteins that are destined for export to the cell surface, um, but it's not found at all for proteins that are found inside the cell. Okay, so proteins that hang out inside the cell don't get modified. It's only the proteins on the outside of the cell. So the cell is sort of this exterior of um, lots of carbohydrate stuff and an interior that's sugar free. Okay, this is sort of the gumdrop uh, model for what a cell would look like, right? The outside over here has all the carbohydrates and sugars and the inside is chock full of proteins and DNA and RNA. Okay. Ugh. All right. Um, okay, so let's talk very briefly about how you assemble, um, in this case, e the O-linked uh, 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 carbo uh, glycoproteins. Okay, so an O-linked glycoprotein has an oxygen that will be the recipient nucleophile for modification. 
Okay, so in other words, either a serine or a threonine residue where this, um, uh, this beta hydroxyl um, becomes modified by the carbohydrate. So um, the hydroxyl is the nucleophile. The electrophile then must be the um, monosaccharide that's going to be adding to it. And so um, the way nature does this to convert uh, a carbohydrate into an effective electrophile is to attach it to UDP. Okay, so um, this is being attached to uh, UDP, um, and this UDP is basically a big leaving group. We've seen this strategy before. This is analogous to ATP, where the AMP was just a big leaving group for a transfer of a phosphate group. In this case, we want to transfer this glycan subunit, and so we attach it up to a UDP and then use an enzyme called beta D uh, xylosyl transferase. Okay, so the key though is that this is a big leaving group and so that in the end transfers xylose to this hydroxide giving us a new, uh, um, a, a new glycosidic bond. And then over here, um, in this case over here, uh, this UDP is attached to a different monosaccharide. This one N-acetylgalactose, uh, Galnac, and um, it also can be used to modify either serine or threonine side chains. Okay, so in the end, um, these over here that are modified first with xylose um, turn into proteoglycans. So those are the proteins on the surface of the cell um, and that are, you know, basically hanging out as big shrubbery. The other ones, the ones that get modified by the N-acetyl uh, gal galactose, these galnacs, then get turned into mucins. So these mucins are proteins that are secreted and um, are these sort of water-loving proteins that are important um, at sort of the, the membrane uh, interstices between, uh, you know, um, uh, air and water phases, okay? And so I'm being coy about this. These, this is the snot of the cell, okay? This is the, the mucus. Mucins, mucus, derived from the same root. We'll take a look closer in a moment to see all the other stuff that gets um, added on. Both of these, though, involve more glycosylation. So in all cases that we're going to see today, we're going to start with a common core and then we're going to do a lot of uh, modification, okay? So um, here's one example of this. So after we start with this common core that I've already showed you, this is the, the galacto, uh, this was the um, xylose uh, that we saw in the previous slide. There's a series of galactosyl transferases that use the UDP galactose and then transfer on one galactose at a time. So we start again with xylose, we add on one, one galactose in black, a second galactose in black, and this gives us um, the uh, trisaccharide core that the proteoglycan will use then um, as sort of its starting unit, okay? So um, this becomes sort of the, um, the uh, it's kind of like the spool that the thread is going to be wound onto. Many different colors of thread can be wound onto the same spool, but in all cases, we're going to use a spool that starts off as this trisaccharide, okay? And so um, the strategy here that I'm showing you can also be used for making repeating disac uh, disaccharides as well. All right, let's take a look at some examples of this. Um, do you remember on uh, Thursday, and I'm hoping you all watched the Thursday videotape, that's why I gave you the quiz. Um, if you watched the Thursday videotape, uh, the second to last slide dealt with those knee joint um, uh, polysaccharides, okay? And we talked, our knee joint oligosaccharides. And we talked a little bit about how these were things that were heavily sulfated. Right, so the sulfates were nice, they're highly negatively charged. The negative charge attracts water and it also repels them from each other, so that pushes them apart. This makes um, a gel that's um, pretty cushioning, right, because all the molecules are kind of forced apart from each other and there's plenty of water in between. Um, okay, so this is um, the start over here. So here's the protein that's going to be modified, um, a serine, and then as usual, it always starts with the xylose and then two galactose, gal, 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 gal. And then there's a series of other modifications that are appended to this. Um, these are things like um, N-acetyl glucose uh, galactose that also has a sulfate group, okay? Or N-acetyl galactose that doesn't have a, um, a, uh, a um, sulfate group, but it, uh, has, it still has the N-acetyl portion. So in the end, this we can get, um, uh, we can get, or sorry, this is actually glucose, N-acetyl glucose 
that um, is uh, you know attached. So this gives us. Um, heparin sulfate, which plays important roles also on just kind of the cell surfaces and for cell signaling. We'll see that later. Um, and then over here, these chondro chondroitin sulfates, dermatin sulfates, these are, are things that are going to be shuffled off into the interstices between joints. Okay, and notice that these are pretty heavily sulfated as well. So these are negatively charged, hygroscopic, meaning they attract water. Okay, um, so snot and mucus. Um, I mean, everyone's puzzled about what this stuff could possibly be. Uh, I can finally tell you. Uh, so uh, these are highly glycosylated proteins that are held together by uh, disulfide bonds. And then um, they have the, the counter ions are calcium. Okay, so when these things are synthesized, they're synthesized with these calcium ions. Okay, and that has the effect of making them really compact when they're synthesized. Right? You have the positive charge on the calcium, you have the negative charges on the sulfates, the whole thing kind of curls up really, really tightly. Okay? Now, what happens is when they get excreted, the calcium ions are stripped off. They're grabbed by a machinery, a transport machinery that um, exchanges them off. So the calcium ions are pulled off and then what ends up happening is this stuff over here, all this negative charge, then soaks up water like, uh, you know, just in a tremendous degree, to a tremendous degree. So the water comes rushing in over here and that has the effect of tremendously expanding the volume of these mucins. So they're super compact when they're in the, the calcium uh, neutralized state. The calcium gets pulled away and now they ex expand hugely. So this is how your little mucus, uh, you know, membranes can secrete enormous quantities of stuff from such, you know, small little cells. And so, um, for example, uh, snails leave behind these tracks. This is more or less the um, oligosaccharide that's depicted here. And um, a very similar strategy is used in disposable diapers, which have these polyacrylates. Okay, so again, you have this negative charge that's feeling unsatisfied and is looking for water. And when it finds water, it grabs onto it with tremendous uh, avidity and grabs onto lots of water by weight. Um, these uh, disposable diapers are actually kind of the, this miracle of, of modern chemistry. Right? These things soak up uh, enormous quantities of water relative to their weights. Okay, and similarly, the, the snot in your nose is um, soaking up enormous quantities of water as well and uh, being secreted. Okay, and that makes it very effective, right, as a way of um, forming a, um, a transition barrier between uh, uh, gas phase and then liquid phase. Okay, um, <laughs> one year I got uh, asked by um, a dieting student if it would be a good idea for her to blow her nose more often as a way of uh, secreting carbohydrates um, to lose weight. And, um, I thought that was a really novel idea. The, the truth is though, the, the um, quantity of carbohydrate in snot is actually very, very low um, because a lot of that stuff is just water, okay, because of the sulfates, right? This thing is so highly sulfated that there's really very little carbohydrate there. It's mainly just water. Okay, so let's talk next about the N-link glycosides. Now things are going to get more complex, uh, complex here. We've already seen, um, oh, okay, so First of all, um, there's three major types that are found in eukaryotes. However, they all have a common core. This is comforting to us, right? This is uh, similar to what we saw when we looked at the O-linked glyco glycosides, uh, the O-linked proteoglycans on a previous slide. They all had that co common uh, xylose, N-galnac, or galnac, galnac uh, core. In this case, we're seeing a very similar structure where we have th these two Glycnacs in a row. So these are glucose and acetyl glucosamines in a row. So one, two, and then there's these mannoses over here, and then things start to get a little crazy. Okay? But you can see again the strategy here is start with a fairly common core, not counting this fucose, but for the most part, you know, things are fairly common. And then um, modify and customize depending upon uh, the needs. Okay, so everything is starting off pretty normal, um, but then things start to get more wild as we go down here. Um, okay, one last thought. I've switched nomenclatures. Earlier I was showing you nomenclature like this. Um, this starts to become increasingly less useful to us. Okay, I mean in this case we have an N, uh, we have an amine uh, that's appended to a, a, a glucose and that's sulfated. 
um, you know, these things start to get uh, increasingly baroque. And so um, rather than trying to depict these structures and then spending time thinking about, oh, is that a glucose? Is that a galactose? Instead, we're going to transition to a, a much simpler uh, type of nomenclature that's based upon three letters. So glucose would be GLC, galactose would be GAL, and mannose would be MAN, et cetera. So from that, from this, these three letters, you could kind of figure out uh, what structures you're looking at. Okay, now, admittedly, this would be a challenge for anyone in this classroom, okay? And I'm not asking you to do that, okay? So I'm not asking you to memorize the nine structures uh, of monosaccharides that are found in these, in these uh, found in, in humans, okay? But I just want you to be comfortable with the idea that these are carbohydrates and these designate carbohydrates. You never know when this information is going to be useful. Um, who knows, maybe some pharmacology class that you take many years from now. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the mechanism for glycosyl transfer. It turns out this is actually not a, a very straightforward mechanism. I didn't dwell on this in the case of the O-linked uh, glycosides um, because uh, those, those work so well. Oxygen is a fantastic nucleophile. The oxygen doesn't have a carbonyl nearby. But for the N-linked glycosides, for the, uh, things are a little bit more uh, complicated. And that's because we're going to attach things not to nitrogen found on lysine side chains, but instead nitrogen that's found um, largely on asparagine side chains. And so the nitrogen over here is next to a carbonyl. It's a carboxamide, right? And this carboxamide functionality is not nearly as nucleophilic as just a free-floating nitrogen with its lone pair hanging out. You remember earlier in the class, I told you that the lone pair on this nitrogen spends a good 40% of its time uh, hanging out as the resonance structure, forming a nitrogen carbon double bond right here. Okay, and because that nitrogen carbon double bond is there 40% of the time, the lone pair on the nitrogen isn't so reactive. It doesn't have some moral imperative that makes it want to run out the door in the morning and start looking around for electrophiles. It's extremely unreactive. And so instead, um, what happens is there are specific sequences that present asparagine in a way that allows this reaction to take place. Okay, so this is an example of um, substrate assisted catalysis. I'll explain in a moment. But um, note in the structure of these, uh, of these uh, glycosyl transferases, there's a base. The base can deprotonate this nitrogen and the electrons that are uh, then bounce their way to form the nitrogen carbon double bond. But then on a nearby hydroxyl bearing side chain, either a serine or a threonine, there's a, a, a proton that can protonate this carbonyl. And so the net result is an imidate tautomer, this structure here, which has an unmasked lone pair. Otherwise, the lone pair is hidden away. It's not so available, really, for doing reactivity. But after this, this neat sort of bendy side chain uh, um, gets into place and gives you the perfect proton nearby, um, then all of a sudden the lone pair is uncovered and ready for reactivity, okay? And notice that it doesn't have anywhere to go. It, it's like naked out there and it's trying to figure out what it should do next. And so it will more readily attack um, this uh, activated uh, glycan. Note that X over here is some leaving group. So we already saw earlier today, one good leaving group was UDP. And we don't have to dwell on the structure of the leaving group, but suffice it to say, it's something that likes to take off, okay? It's effective uh, leaving group. Note too, the structural requirements for this reaction to take place. There has to be this bend, this 180 degree turn that places the hydroxide in close proximity to the carbonyl of this asparagine side chain. If you don't get that bendy structure, the reaction doesn't take place. That's absolutely mandatory for this to, um, to uh, for this reaction. Okay, so um, I call this an example of substrate assisted catalysis because this is catalysis that's assisted by the substrate itself. The substrate, the starting material for the reaction is this asparagine bearing motif and that participates um, in this case by providing acid, Lewis, uh, or sorry, Bronsted acid catalysis to protonate this carbonyl. Okay. 
So again, um, certain sequences are required. If R is not correct here, if a serine or, or um, three anine is not available at this position, it's game over. Okay, so this only works with certain substrates. Okay, and that actually gives you a degree of selectivity. All right, brace yourself. Now things are going to get really complicated. What happens is um, very complicated structures get synthesized as N-linked uh, glycans, and then they get trimmed back by scissors, by glycoside, uh, glycosidases, the class of enzymes that we saw last Thursday. So what happens is you get these very complicated structures coming out, and then they're kind of randomly chopped apart by a series of different, uh, in this case, uh, glucose, glucosidases or mannosidases. These are just simply glycosidases. These are enzymes that cleave apart uh, uh, um, glycosidic bonds. And we saw a good example of that last time when we talked about uh, lysozyme. I think actually we've seen it now for a couple of weeks running. So um, here's the thing though. Because these uh, glucosidases and these glycosidases in general aren't programmed uh, to be really specific about this bond versus this bond, um, this has the effect of introducing randomness onto the surface of your cells. So really, the ultimate uh, glycan that gets appended and appears out on the surface of the cells um, is, is sort of uh, a little bit random. It's not exactly programmed in. Um, this element of random dramatically increases the structural diversity of the chemical compounds found on the surface of your cells. And note, too, that this diversity is not encoded by the genome. Okay, this is diversity that's kind of, this is post-translational modification diversity that um, just adds like a whole new element of complexity to thinking about the chemical environment of the cell. And um, I'll be honest, this is daunting. Okay, this kind of stuff of randomness and, you know, different structures scares the heck out of me. Okay, I don't know how to even think about this sort of thing. It um, is, is very, very intimidating in a way. The idea that I cannot determine exactly what the structures are on the surface of the cell, and furthermore, that the analytical tools that I have available to me as a chemist in 2013 are not good enough for me to go in and tell you exactly what the structures are on the surface of the cell, I find that um, really annoying and uh, very, very intimidating. Okay, and so um, this is a very important frontier in chemical biology, and I encourage you to think about it. Okay, if you want to develop an A-plus proposal topic, come up with a way of figuring out what these structures are on the surface of the cell. I guarantee it to you that will um, rock the world, okay? Because um, we know that these are important in various diseases, yet we don't have a good way of characterizing what they are. It's one of the last frontiers of analytical chemistry, really. Okay, and um, let's talk about what they do. All right, so um, one thing that was thought early on is maybe they're hanging out on the surface of the cell um, to grab on to passing other cells. And a great example of this would be um, a T cell communicating with an antigen presenting cell down here. And we definitely see the carbohydrates. They're highlighted in these sort of brown structures that are hanging out. And you can see they're even you know, making contact and they're doing stuff. But the truth is, um, when we cut them off the surface of the cell, um, or we set up a cell line that doesn't produce those, the cells talk to each other just fine. Okay, so it doesn't seem to be required for every communication. It only seems to be required for some communications, some molecular recognition between cells. Oh, and recall that we discussed earlier how communication between cells and communication between proteins is like a braille process where the proteins and the molecules feel each other and look for complementary surfaces, uh, complementary functionalities and different uh, structures. That's the sort of thing that we're talking about here. So in this case, we can remove the carbohydrates and the two, prote the two cells talk to each other just fine, okay? Um, but here's one thing that uh, they do seem to do. So um, for example, they can play a key role in antibody recognition. So um, the uh, glycosides that modify antibodies tend to be pretty heterogeneous. Again, that's the whole randomness that we discussed earlier. On the other hand, they do seem to be required for um, antibody function. Okay, so here's the oligosaccharides down here. Um, here's the structure of the antibody that I introduced to you way back, I think, on week one of this class. And then recall that they're going to be recognizing antigens up here. 
Um, they're modified as N-link glycans. And again, as N-link glycans, they have the common core that we've discussed earlier today. Um, and then there's a bunch of sialic acids and other types of modifications that are appended to this. And even though they're quite heterogeneous, they do seem to be important. If you produce your antibodies without the carbohydrates, they tend not to fold as well. They tend not to um, function as well at recognition. So um, the carbohydrates seem to play important roles in protein folding. Okay, that's one role. Um, number two, they seem to play important roles in solubilizing proteins. And number three, they also seem to um, be important for uh, protecting structures that otherwise might be recognized by the immune response. They seem to be good at kind of providing shielding, like a um, force field or something that keeps back immune uh, uh, molecules. Uh, a big challenge for us and a big challenge for the biotechnology industry in general is that um, the proteins that we produce aren't being produced largely by human cells. Okay, and so um, uh, in the biotechnology industry, uh, we sold something like 25 to 30 billion dollars, billion with a B, worth of antibodies last year. Okay, so this structure here, that's a 25 billion dollar plus uh, industry in the United States. Okay, and these are used for everything from treating cancer to treating autoimmune diseases. But um, in, uh, we we, um, we rely very heavily on Chinese hamster ovary cells to produce the, um, uh, the antibodies for us. And I know what you're thinking. Why Chinese hamster ovaries? Um, why cells from that particular organism? Um, it ha it's mainly historical. These are cells that grow really robustly. They really uh, whip out a huge quantity of antibodies. Um, and uh, you, can you can grow these cells in 10,000 liter fermenters. Okay, I mean, the, the size of this, the scale of this production boggles the mind. Okay, just imagine this whole room here uh, that we're in filled with fetal calf serum, which is what these guys like to eat, um, you know, or something else that's kind of like the serum uh, uh, found out of blood, you know, but it's artificial. Just this whole room filled with this stuff and cells sloshing around. And then you have a bunch of chemical engineers that are carefully controlling the oxygen content, the carbon dioxide content, and the pH of the solution. Um, the level of control is pretty amazing too. But all that is necessary to produce this $25 billion product. And um, here's an issue that comes up. When we look carefully at the identity of the carbohydrates found on the surface of the antibodies, there's divergence between what's found on human antibodies uh, shown in this column versus what's found in these Chinese hamster ovary cells found in this column. That diversity though doesn't seem, divergence though, doesn't seem to have very much functional consequence. We seem to be okay with that. So antibodies that are produced in this way are given to patients on a daily basis and, and seem to be perfectly functional. Okay, even over long, long terms. Okay, now along the lines of giving stuff to patients, um, modification by glycans is a very important um, side reaction that takes place almost as soon as uh, pharmaceuticals are, are taken by the patient. Um, this is one that um, I know someone in this class is going to end up spending their lifetime studying. Okay, anyone who goes into pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, uh, some small percentage of you will be concerned about what happens to the pharmaceutical after it gets taken up by the patient. And one of the first reactions that takes place in the body is the body tries to solubilize a thing. Oftentimes pharmaceuticals are pretty insoluble. And we already talked earlier this quarter about um, cytochrome P450 that has a strategy of introducing oxygen to solubilize, say, benzopyrenes, things that otherwise would be insoluble. In this case, though, the strategy for solubilization is to transfer this, um, gluc this uh, glucose, this glucuronidide uh, molecule to it. So starting with UDP uh, glucuronidide, you can basically transfer this to give us uh, a glucuronidide, uh, glucuronidated uh, molecule. So there's a hydroxyl in the, um, in, the, in the compound that's being given to the patient. That then gets, becomes the nucleophile to attack this activated glycan to give us um, a modified uh, product over here. And this thing is going to be a lot more soluble, right? It has negative charge, it has lots of hydroxyls that could form hydrogen bonds with water. And so this, takes, this has the effect of taking something that's pretty insoluble and converting it into something that's really soluble. 
Okay, and this is a good strategy. This works a lot. This is one of the very first breakdown products that are found when we look at what happens to pharmaceuticals after they're uh, ingested by patients. Okay, last topic that I want to talk to you about. Um, who had glucose with their cereal this morning? Or who had uh, like sugary cereals for breakfast? Okay, I did too. I love sugar in the mornings. Okay, so um, chances are that that glucose, the, the sucrose that you took has now been broken down into glucose and fructose, and that stuff is now running around your bloodstream as we speak. And in response to this, your body has evolved this really effective way of coaxing um, this uh, glucose to be either taken up or taken down. And you probably even know about this. This is a, a system that's controlled by the hormone insulin. Okay, so the way this works is the, the goal is to have a steady state concentration of glucose out here in the, in the um, blood vessels. And um, glucose is constantly being uh, either expelled or, um, or pumped in. Insulin triggers glucose uptake by the cells. So after you eat, insulin's released, glucose gets taken up by the muscle or fat cells, and they do with it what they will. Okay? So um, when you were sweating, when we took that little quiz earlier, uh, that was your glucose going to work. Okay? Um, the problem, though, is um, when the cells become uh, less sensitive to insulin, and this part over here shuts down. When that shuts down, the concentration of glucose in the blood vessels skyrockets. And the problem is, this glucose stuff is not totally benign. Okay, recall earlier, we discussed how it can form the hemiacetal form and it can form an aldehyde form. The aldehyde form is a very effective electrophile. And if you have a high enough concentration, you have lots and lots of these aldehyde forms running around looking for some nucleophile to react with. And that can't be good. Okay, and so what happens is you end up with random modifications of proteins on the surface of the cell. So this happens spontaneously to all proteins found in serum and in the, uh, the blood, um, and this causes problems. Okay, so um, here's the structure of a protein that's been heavily uh, glycosylated, and um, these modifications are um, spontaneous. These are non-enzymatically controlled. Um, they just happen um, uh, spontaneously. Let me show you the mechanism for, uh, uh, for this reaction. Okay, so um, here's glucose over here. Here's lysine on some surface cell. Let's just call it serum albumin. Okay, so human serum albumin is present at millimolar concentration in your blood, and um, there will be a lysine side chain that can then react with the um, electrophilic um, uh, anomeric carbon of this glucose. Okay, this is a reaction called an Amadori reaction. Okay, it happens pretty spontaneously. Um, key intermediate here, what do you guys think the key intermediate it is? How does this Amadori reaction go? Sergio? Okay, so I have a nucleophile. What's the electrophile? Carl? What's that? Yes. All right. In the clutch. Nice job. Okay, so this anomeric carbon can um, tautomerize into an aldehyde. That can then react with this, uh, this um, amine to give you a shift base. And uh, through some other, you know, proton transfer steps, you get to this product here. Okay, this doesn't look so bad, right? The problem, though, is um, this sets you up, though, for something that uh, is a lot less benign. Okay, we have a carbonyl over here that's a new electrophilic site, and this can rearrange to give us an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. Another lysine either on the same protein or a neighboring protein, can then react with this. And the net effect here is to cross-link two proteins. Okay, so you take these two free-floating proteins that are normally just kind of swimming around and happy as can be in your uh, serum, and now you're tethering them together. Or even worse, you're tethering to the surface of the cell. So um, the cell doesn't know what to do about this. Uh, the immune system doesn't know what to do about this. And the immune system really is kind of the sledgehammer. It, it responds the way it likes to respond, which is to increase inflammation. And so the net effect of this is you get um, a massive, you get an inflammation response 
which um, you know, kind of spirals out of control. Okay, so you get these things that are tethering carbohydrates to the surface of the cell and then they get more and more complicated and more and more baroque as more reactions take place and you just start to accumulate uh, these advanced glycosylation end products that uh, you know, lead uh, to inflammation and disease. Okay, so this is why um, too much glucose is a really bad thing and um, our American diets are, seem to be ideally suited for uh, maximizing concentrations of glucose, which is uh, a really particularly bad thing, a pernicious thing really. Okay, so advanced glycosylation end products lead to inflammation. Okay, it's kind of like accretion, right? It's, it's sort of getting in, in, in the way of the, um, of the immune system. Okay, so um, naturally being chemists um, and being uh, innovative people, we like to invent stuff that would offer us that same wonderful taste of sugar sweet but not offer the same uh, glucose uh, um, potentialities. So um, we've been doing things for years that involve trying to have the same amount of sweetness but just lower concentrations of glucose. So for example, fructose is like 2x sweeter than sucrose. Um, but because it's just half of the sucrose, it's actually um, half the calories and it doesn't have the glucose that's going to be floating around looking for reactions to do. Okay? So um, you can get fructose pretty readily out of honey. Honey is twice as sweet for the calories. Um, it doesn't taste the same, I know, but uh, it's pretty effective. Um, this is another one. Trehillulose uh, is also used pretty extensively. So um, we do things like this all the time. We'll, we'll substitute one thing for another. Some things are sweeter than others, um, offering less calories. This has been done for, uh, you know, 100 years or so, maybe even longer. Okay, the other thing that happens is we also have invented a series of compounds that don't look anything like carbohydrates, but activate the same carbohydrate um, uh, or activate the same receptors for sweet taste. So for example, aspartame is a um, dipeptide uh, that's methylated at the C terminus that um, is 180 times sweeter than sugar. Okay, you can eat this stuff and it is insanely, insanely sweet. Okay, I mean it leaves your, your lips going like that for hours. I mean it's really, really that sweet. Okay, you don't want to like stick your tongue in this stuff. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, is the problem with this, though, is that it, can, um, it has a rearrangement that forms a, a diketopiprazine. This is a diketopiprazine. And um, uh, neotame, its more modern variant, uh, avoids the diketopiprazine by having this big um, you know, uh, functional group on the side. And it's also way, way sweeter than sucrose. Okay, sucrose is kind of the gold standard here. That's table sugar. 10,000 times sweeter for the weight. That's kind of amazing. Um, the, um, the other thing is we've also come up with things that look like carbohydrates but cannot be um, uh, hydrolyzed and digested. So for example, these chlorine substituted uh, versions of sucrose. Okay, so this is like sucrose over here except now instead of hydroxyls we have chlorines. This is a compound called sucralose. Um, you, can also uh, you can also isolate from plants, from the sweet leaf plant shown here. You can isolate stevia. Um, to me, this one tastes a little bit bitter. I don't know if anyone does stevia with their coffee, but um, I can definitely taste it. That one ta just doesn't taste the same. Um, it gets even wilder than that. There's uh, you know, amazingly sweet compounds that you can extract out of um, bushes and uh, plants that um, are so sweet that they kind of overwhelm your, your sweet receptors and leave you um, with this permanent sweet taste that affects the flavor of everything you eat afterwards. Okay, so I mean you can eat these compounds. Um, one of them is called like the miracle berry or something like that. And you eat this stuff and then um, you know for 10 minutes afterwards you can eat like lemon juice and uh, you know drink lemon juice or uh, eat olives and stuff like that and everything tastes sweet. I mean it tastes really good sweet. Um, it also tastes a little weird. Okay, but the stuff is just amazingly effective. Okay, um, any questions about carbohydrates? Ask now. Yeah, oh, Chelsea. Yeah. The uh, yeah, diketopiprazine. Oh, okay. Yeah, that is an issue because this diketopiprazine thing no longer tastes sweet. Okay, and the problem is when you cook with aspartame, 
uh, the high temperatures encourages this to form. Okay, and that's a problem because um, you want sweet over here and suddenly you have something that's not sweet. And so that's why we find aspartame in uh, like Coca-Cola, like Diet Coke and, um, or actually I shouldn't say that, I don't know what's actually in Diet Coke. But you find it in like diet soft drinks, but you don't really find it in say diet donuts. Okay, right? Anything that encounters high temperature, um, aspartame is not going to work for. So instead, um, we tend to turn to things like sucralose and other things. Okay. Thanks for asking over here. I have not tried it. Have you? Okay. I'd like to try it. <laughs> I like trying things that taste weird. So, that are, uh, you know, fully edible and uh, healthy. <laughs> okay. Um, let's move on. I want to talk to you next about uh, polyketides. And um, earlier in the class, uh, I told you that we're going to organize everything according to the central dogma of modern biology. We're now down here. We've talked about oligosaccharides. We're now at the point that we're going to talk about polyketides and then terpenes in the next couple of days. And this is a fascinating class of, of um, compounds that really gets underplayed in uh, biology classes, but really deserves the spotlight because they do so much for us. These are found, um, oh, let me talk to you about their structure and then I'll show you where they're found. They're found in all kinds of antibiotics and fats. So for example, this polyketide is a very nice fatty acid. And um, all polyketides and terpenes are formed from repeating subunits, which I've highlighted here. So in black, these two carbon uh, unit subunits are going to be introduced in modular fashion such that the red bonds can be synthesized the same way every time. Similarly, terpenes are modules of, um, of, um, of five carbon units, isoprene units, that are strung together and connected by these red bonds. Okay? So um, we're going to be talking um, about, um, okay, so again, these are composed of repeating subunits of modular bonds. Okay, so here's some examples of polyketides, and I think this illustrates their uh, tremendous structural diversity and, um, dare I say it, their beauty. Uh, if molecules can have beauty, these are beautiful. Um, because uh, look, at, look at this erythronolide over here. It's just so kid and cute to me. It um, has uh, a lactone structure, lots and lots of functionality sticking off of it. Um, it's got a ketone over here, um, and it's perfectly uh, evolved uh, to the point where it's a very effective uh, antibiotic. So this is the erith erythromycin antibiotic that many of you have probably encountered at some point in your lifetimes. Um, they these are also extend to the um, fatty acids and um, fats as well. So you can get really complicated uh, polyketides like this one. You can also have the aromatic compounds. These aromatic compounds are basically folded up um, uh, fatty acid type things that have a key set of carbon-carbon double bonds that then cyclize to give you these aromatic rings. So if you wonder, when we talked about how those aromatic rings form, they're being formed along the same polyketide synthesis. Okay, so earlier in the quarter, quarter I showed you donomycin, rebecamycin, uh, a variant of the compound shown here. Um, that was synthesized by polyketide synthesis. Okay, synthesizes by cells. Um, okay. So um, all polyketides are built by a straightforward aldol reaction. But um, because this aldol involves an ester, it's called by the name clasin. It's a clasin reaction. Okay, and this is why I love the aldol reaction. This is how um, the majority of carbon-carbon bonds are formed in nature. Okay, the vast majority are formed using this reaction. And so I want to take a moment just to appreciate how this works. Okay, and we're going to start with the um, variant that's found in the laboratory. Okay, so in the laboratory, an aldol reaction, um, you would start a uh, clasin reaction, you'd start with an ester, and then you'd add some sort of strong base that would then deprotonate this alpha proton over here, give you an enolate, and the enolate can attack electrons, swish down here, swish over here, and then kick all the way up to the oxygen. The net effect is we have a new carbon-carbon bond right here. Okay, this works really well. This is a great way to make carbon-carbon uh, bonds. 
this is really how the experts build carbon-carbon bonds. And, um, and then in the end, this tetrahedral intermediate collapses, and that gives us this uh, new compound that has a new carbon-carbon bond on it. Okay, the problem for nature is that nature doesn't have access to strong bases like this one. That strong base is totally unique just to um, this particular, uh, you know, what's found in nature. Okay, so it doesn't work so well for, um, uh, for cells. Okay, you just don't have access to bases that are going to be strong enough to readily deprotonate an alpha proton. And so instead, um, what nature tends to do is um, a little trick that I'll show you a couple slides from now. Okay, so um, first let me just uh, set the stage. Um, what we're going to see is we're going to see instead of esters, we're going to see thioesters but it's also called uh, a clasin as well, okay? And we're going to see thioesters between either acetyl-CoA's, like this guy, or propionyl-CoA's. So if the compound needs an extra methyl group, you start with the shelf that has the propionyl. If you just want two carbons, then you start with the acetyl, okay? But the idea is the same. We get more or less the same reaction. Um, the problem is these two and three carbon building blocks are small and slippery. It would be very hard for the cell to kind of like grab onto these things uh, if they were just two or three carbons. So instead, the strategy that the cell applies is to attach a big old handle to the two and three carbon building block. And that handle is this molecule down here called coenzyme A. So from now on, we're going to leave off this part. We're going to simplify it as just CoA. Okay, that's all of this over here. That's the handle. Okay, so the enzyme grabs onto this part and knows down here that's the two or three carbon part down there. Okay, makes sense? Okay, let's get back to the strategy that the cell uses now to do its clasin. Okay, and I've already told you the cell doesn't have a strong enough base to make the clasin that we use in the lab work. So instead, what the cell does is a decarboxylation reaction, okay, where it actually does, um, uh, oh, actually, shoot. This is incorrect. Uh, it's it's going to do this decarboxylation, loss of carbon dioxide to give us an enolate. Okay, this structure over here is missing a carboxylate. I will have to fix that. Okay, so again, the strategy uh, allows it to access this enolate um, without having a really strong base available. Okay, and in practice, things get even more complicated. In practice, the enzyme that catalyzes the uh, clasin condensation um, simultaneously protonates the recipient uh, uh, ester, thioester, at the same time that it holds in place this enol or enolate. Okay? And this reaction works for both two carbon, as shown here, or three carbon uh, subunits, where these two methyl groups just become like little spectators. Stereochemistry, of course, can be tightly controlled in the active site. Okay, everyone still with me? We're good on the clasin. Okay, I'm just going to invoke the clasin from now on as though it's understood. Okay, so we don't have to do mechanism of clasin anymore. Um, but here's a mechanism that we do have to talk about. Um, one more uh, that's also kind of going to be in our toolkit and we'll see quite a bit. Um, it turns out that these thioesters can very readily uh, do rapid exchange. So you can go from an S-acetyl, uh, an S-CoA thioester to say a cysteine thioester um, simply by the nucleophilic thiolate attacking the carbonyl, kicking up, forming a tetrahedral intermediate which then collapses to give us now um, this acetyl unit attached to the uh, thiolate of the cysteine side chain. This happens really readily. Okay, and this is going to be important because earlier I said that we have these two carbon um, uh, things attached to this big CoA uh, handle, but eventually we're going to want stuff that's sort of in exactly the right spot at the right time, and this gives a way for the um, enzymes to have a cysteine in their active site and then grab on to a two carbon piece very specifically. Okay, so what we're going to see in a moment is one piece of the reaction is going to still have the S-CoA and the other piece will have be attached covalently to the enzyme's active site. Okay, sound good? Simple reaction, nothing too special. 
Okay, now from those simple reactions that I showed you on the previous slide, all kinds of, you know, chemical craziness can emerge. Um, for example, you can very readily form all of these fatty acids. Okay, so these fatty acids, these are all, um, you know, uh, carbon unit, uh, two carbon units that have been built up. Um, these can basically be synthesized using exactly the same Claisen reaction that I showed on a previous slide. Okay, and this is kind of wild. Um, before I get too far, I want to introduce you to some nomenclature. First, um, the real aficionados memorize the structures. Don't memorize the structures of these, okay? Instead, what I want you to know is um, this omega nom nomenclature. Okay, so the omega nomenclature counts from the last carbon of the fatty acid tail. So over here on this side, this is the carboxylate. You can number these carbons, one, two, three, four, five. But it turns out actually the key to controlling their um, structure and their, um, their properties is the carbon-carbon double bonds from the tail of the um, fatty acid. Okay, so you probably have heard omega-3 fatty acids uh, being important in your diet. Omega-3 fatty acids refers to having um, a carbon-carbon double bond that's three carbons from the tail. Okay, so this one would be an omega-3, 6, 9 fatty acid. Okay, because at positions 3, 6, and 9, counted from the tail, um, you have a carbon-carbon double bond. That carbon-carbon double bond crucially sets a lot of the properties of these um, fatty acids. First of all, notice that all of these carbon-carbon double bonds are cis carbon-carbon double bonds. In other words, they have the alkyl groups on the same side. Check this out. All the ones on the previous slide also cis. The vast majority of carbon-carbon double bonds found in fats, found in nature, are cis olefins, okay? Not trans olefins. Trans fats are found in artificial fat sources that have been partially hydrogenated. Those trans fats are difficult to digest and uh, tend to do things like clog arteries and things like that, which is why they're associated with heart disease. Okay, so naturally occurring cis olefins counted from the omega side over here. Um, fish and canola oils have a very high concentration of these omega-3 uh, fatty acids. And it's crucial to maintain the correct viscosity of your cells to have a, a certain ratio of these omega-3 fatty acids versus omega-6 fatty acids. So omega-6 fatty acids are found in things like corn oil and sort of cheap soybean oils, you know, uh, inexpensive for, uh, uh, forms of oil like safflower oil, um, you know, things like that that are found in processed foods. The problem, though, is that when your um, ratios of omega-6 to omega-3 um, get uh, off from where they should be ideally, the viscosity of your cell walls, of, or your, of your plasma membrane, not the walls, but the membrane, changes. And that viscosity seems to be a crucial characteristic of um, brain function and other functions. And so it's really important that in your diet, you have enough omega-3 fatty acids, again, this is omega-3 fatty acid, to replace these omega-6 fatty acids. It's simply an equilibrium, depending on your diet. The more omega-6s you eat, the more omega-6s that appear on the surfaces of your cells. Okay, how are these things made? This is the machine of dreams. This little machine over here synthesizes these fats um, in a truly wondrous cycle. Okay, and I absolutely love this chemistry because um, it's totally easy to understand, yet it's so incredibly powerful. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a schematic diagram for a fatty acid synthase. Okay, so this is the thing that's going to be synthesizing a molecule like this. And it turns out that the enzyme is built of one chain. Okay, so it has a single continuous um, amide bond uh, linked protein. Okay, it happens to be a very large protein. This thing is, um, is a monster in terms of size. And um, different domains of the protein are folded up into different enzyme active sites. Um, each one of these enzyme active sites is labeled with a little code that I'll decipher for you next. Okay, so we're going to have in the very center, for example, um, a, a domain called an acyl carrier protein. This is going to act as a robot arm that's going to be carrying the intermediates between each 
of these active sites and the whole thing is going to go around a bunch of times as it's acted upon during the synthesis of the fat. Okay? Everyone still with me? Great. Let's get started with step one. This is the loading of the starting material onto this acyl carrier protein. Acyl carrier protein looks like this. There happens to be a serine residue um, over here. Um, that's going to be um, where this thing is going to get loaded onto. Okay? Um, between uh, the seri uh, between the, um, the, starting, uh, the starting piece over here, there's also this phosphopentathienyl uh, group that just gives it a little bit more space, okay? Extends it out a little bit further. Okay, so the acyl carrier protein is over here. Um, again, we have a thiol over here. The thiol is perfect for the thiol exchange, the thioester exchange that I showed on a previous slide, okay? Thiol then can exchange, an exchange with acetyl-CoA to set you up to start this process. Okay, so here's how it works. Here's that thiol on the phospho, uh, phospho, uh, phospho-pantothienyl group over here. Here's the thiolate. It attacks acetyl-CoA. You get a nice transacylation reaction. Okay, so you can either start off with two carbons or you can start off with three carbons. Three carbons is nice, right, because that sets you up for forming an enolate. So it kind of depends on if you want to start off by being the enolate, being the nucleophile, or start off as being the uh, electrophile, okay? All right, so the next step is acyl carrier protein. Um, the robot arm, the phosphopentathienyl, moves, it, moves the acetyl coa, the, sorry, moves the acetyl group over to the ketosynthase active site, abbreviated KS. KS then does a thioester uh, exchange uh, grabbing on to the acetyl uh, functionality and setting you up for a Claisen condensation. Here's first the decarboxylation to form the enolate, and then here's our Claisen reaction that we've seen previously that gives us the new carbon-carbon bond right here. And in the end, the acyl carrier protein comes back and then picks up this uh, product again. Okay, so basically the acyl carrier protein delivers the thing to one of these active sites. The reaction takes place, in this case a Claisen, and then it picks it back up and moves to the next site. Um, that's really elegant stuff. Okay, um, the next reaction that can take place is a keto reductase. Notice that the product over here um, is a ketone. And so um, you can, obviously, ketones don't appear in um, these fatty acids. And so we have to get rid of the ketone. So the first step is to do a reduction of the ketone. Nature's hydride's choice is NADPH. This is analogous to NADH that we saw earlier in the quarter. Um, hydride gets uh, kicked out, reduces the, um, the carbonyl, and that gives us an alcohol. This alcohol then can be eliminated by a dehydratase. Okay, so dehydratase protonates the hydroxide, and then we do a, a, a straightforward either E2 elimination or E1CB. The jury is still a little bit uh, mixed on this one. Um, in the end, though, we get a carbon carbon double bond. And then this carbon carbon double bond can be reduced using, again, NADPH, nature's reductant, using exactly the same reaction, more or less. Okay? And in the end, um, and then the very last reaction will be simply hydrolyzing off from acyl carrier protein using a mechanism that's analogous to serine protease. Okay, so let's put all this together. Okay, so here we are. This is our schematic diagram. Acyl carrier protein starts off thirst first. Um, it gets loaded up. And then it brings the acetyl group to the keto, uh, or sorry, it's going to bring the acetyl group to the ketosynthase. Um, this then does its Claisen reaction. It comes over here to the keto reductase, and then the enol, and then the dehydratase over here, and then the enoil reductase. I know these things don't seem like they're in order, okay? But schematic diagram, it seems like it's kind of jerking back and forth, but um, that's more or less what's happening. And then when you get to after the first two carbons are added, then you get back to the ketosynthase and you add another two carbons or three carbons. 
get to this, go to this one, go to this one, go to that one, and repeat the process multiple times until the fatty acid can no longer fit in the fatty acid synthase, at which point then this thioesterase comes along and hydrolyzes off the thioester from the acyl carrier protein. Okay, when we st let's stop here. When we come back, we'll be looking at even more complex polyketides and uh, their synthesis.